Cinema Cast. I'm Kyle. And I'm Cody. I don't think we've introduced ourselves for like a few episodes. I am back for the second time in the last two weeks. Yeah, two episodes in a row. Doing um the episode that won the tenth episode poll, uh Titan AE. Um it received two votes. <laughs> so also fucking fa- uh, Zuckerberg. Uh Mr. Zuckerberg. Please fucking re-enable the fucking poll option for the Facebook. Or on your new post creator. Thank you very much. Fuck. That, I think that hurt us with this. Because it's not a thing anymore. You gotta go into the menu now. And it's like, fuck off. Just put the poll option in there. Jeez. So, first, uh, <laughs> I just got the news that they're releasing, uh, wonder woman 84 um in on streaming and oh. uh, i didn't know so many yeah i didn't know so many people were so hard done by by watching movies in their house i think as long as they do it better than than the disney model i think people will be happy with it oh disney model is absolutely terrible but like we're you gonna spend um, 32 dollars on a movie right yeah no it's like yeah, I'm going to give you a four, a double the money that I would have given the theater that you only got half of. So realistically, you should be ch- charging me like 10 bucks for a rental. And you're making more money that way. So that's the fucking reality of the situation, first of all. And also, they're putting it on a streaming service anyway. So... Uh, depending on what streaming service it is, I guess. Yeah, like... It, no, like here's the Twitter thing. I was just like, not happy with this. Throwing the movie to the dead, just a massive disappointment. I wish they delayed another six months. I'm like, fuck off. They've delayed it six months already. We're waiting so we can go to a fucking filthy theater where everyone's going to get sick. So fuck it. Frankly, no one wants to go to a I fucking mean, movie theater. Canada's just getting well. At least Saskatchewan's just getting huge spikes recently. What was it? 208 new cases? Yeah, we fucked that up like eight months in. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're not going to say we fucked that up eight months in. There's a lot of systemic problems that are leading up to. Uh, Yeah, I guess not us personally. Yes, me and Kyle are the reason (laughs) that uh, Canada got 308. Our evil, part of our evil plan to take over. It didn't have to be this way. You just could have put us in charge. <laughs> could have just listened to our podcast more. Went up to the queen and was just like, hey. <laughs> yeah, we, we went up to the queen. And we were like, hey, Betty, uh, put us in charge of Canada and we'll fix everything. And, and she was like, no. Well, then, fuck you. You deal with this and um, you'll deal with the pestilence until you <laughs> meet our demands. Did you just call her Betty? Yeah, that's her name. I didn't realize you were on a, a first name basis with the queen. <laughs> well, I am a lord. <laughs> you can call yourself a lord all you... I... <laughs> Isn't there, like, a a new scheme where they're like, oh, buy a lordship from, like, this little tiny country in Scotland? Exactly! If they can do that, I can just call myself one. <laughs> Yeah, but if that's the case, if you can be a lawyer, a uh, lord, I, I'm going to be a doctor. Open up a practice. I mean, that's different. Like, you have to have <laughs> well, qualifications to be a doctor. A lord is just, like, some bullshit title. Born into title. Yeah, all I all I really need is, like, to get people to start paying me taxes. And uh, I can just open, like, a Patreon and call it that. I could just call that a, ta- a, a tax <laughs> on like a certain number of people, and those could be my subjects. Um, sure. I mean, it does. I mean, I offer service. I make podcasts, so that's my service. You're paying taxes for the podcast, and it's frankly, it's not even mandatory. Um, so, frankly, I'm already better than most lords. I mean, I'm not requesting any authority, only title. Until that goes to your head. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. I mean, the title of editor hasn't gone to your head yet. I mean, that's you. (laughs) Yeah, I'm really concerned that eventually you're just going to use my uh, audio to cut open a mixtape. Eventually, I'll just start making like a second audacity. I'll open up like a second audacity window 
and just like copy paste different words from you, just slowly making it into something you say something embarrassing. And then I'll like post it on Twitter and get to or 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 you're sitting there and you're like trying to make shift out a, another podcast host so that when I'm gone you can like <laughs> try and <laughs> resemble Kyle and Cody's cult cinema cast by piecing me into the podcast. Just make you into a soundboard. Honestly, just go on sidetrack rant or tangents. And then give somebody a really low score. That's basically I, all I do here. Yeah. yeah. I, just need, you know, <laughs> I just need like an AI that like occasionally Googles things that I haven't Googled. Oh my god. How many episodes are we on? Uh, This will be 35. In total. I want to try and feed, feed <laughs> like force an AI to listen to a hundred of our episodes and then write its own script. I think, uh, you've never seen those pictures on Facebook? I've seen them. I've never, like, like, gone into them. There was, a one recently, like, where they tried to make somebody run, like, or an AI watch a hundred hours of, like, Scott Moe, <laughs> some, like, marketing <laughs> stuff. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know they made one right in an episode of Golden Girls. Was it good? I have no idea. I didn't click on it. Is Golden Girls good? I don't know. I don't think I've ever actually watched a single episode of Golden Girls. Yeah, me neither. So yeah, episode 10. And we're reviewing um, Titan AE, which is a, uh, I guess, maybe the second studio killer we've... Uh, We've reviewed, and this is the first one that we reviewed that's properly killed a studio, I think. What do you mean? Because this is like, uh, um, like this um, was made by Fox Animation, and they didn't make anything out of it, uh, else after this. Pretty sure, just uh, bring it up. Well, okay, um, yeah, it definitely didn't do good. Yeah, yeah, this was the final, uh, um movie produced by fox animation um yeah they did this they didn't do much they just did like anastasia bartok the magnificent which is an anastasia second one and uh titan ae and they also did like some additional stuff on pinches v uh they assisted with prince of egypt but yeah they only made like three movies only two theatrical ones anyway and just like a tv show so yeah that's yeah this is a studio killer it it killed blue, blue skies, correct? No, it blue skies killed Fox Studios? Animation. No, Blue Sky Studio survived. They may they make they're alive still. They make um Ice Age, and that's still around. But like Ice uh Blue Sky actually like emerged from this in a way, mm -hmm. or they, they, it emerged as this was dying. So so yeah, box office of thirty six point eight million. On a budget of of on a budget of seventy five million, so yeah, that's uh, seventy five million on the low end. On the low end, it could be as high as a ninety million, but uh, yeah, so it lost pretty good. Ice Age was made in. It was made after this, but it's Blue Skies like did like some technical work on, I think Anastasia yeah. and maybe this. So two years later. Two two years later, it was released in the U.S. Sorry, that would have bugged me. Yeah, they, they um, I think they did some of the CGI work in this, which is gorgeous. So, uh, yeah, this is a movie starring Matt Damon and Drew Barrymore. Uh, Bill Pullman plays the villain. John Leguizamo is um, a, plays a character. Nathan Lane's in it. Janine Garofalo. Uh, Ron Perlman. Yeah, Ron Perlman's in it, uh, which is important because we stand Ron Perlman here. He's a good actor I like a lot. Well, okay, so I've been listening to a lot of, uh, or watching a lot of Sons of Anarchy again, where uh, Ron Perlman plays Biker Gang, and so I was like, I was like, that sounds like Ron Perlman, but like, I was like, is it Ron Perlman? And I had to Google it, and then it was definitely Ron Perlman. I mostly get him, like, obviously Hellboy 
and like he's the guy from like the fallout intros so yeah this movie came out in 2000 so obviously uh mixed reviews and a box office bomb didn't really get in that a uh, lot of advertising boost um i got it on like dvd when i was six so and that's the dvd i watched this on too so that's fun yeah production issues behind the scene um they didn't really know what they wanted to do after the success of anastasia so yeah they ended up with uh something like this but yeah it's a combination of it's an animated movie of a combination of uh line drawn characters like um of like the people and the aliens in it and uh cgi ship animation um that actually blends in pretty well with the uh dr drawn animation i think like normally <laughs> there's like a lot more uh like um disconnect between them but i think it works pretty well here just how it work how they drew it of like everything that's cg being like so this is um oh when it was uh it was planned to have a video game release and then it was canceled but yeah, no, I think this movie actually looks gorgeous still. Um, I'd almost kind of want to get it on Blu-ray, but I don't think it'll look quite as good if you up the resolution. But I, st I think it looks really good. I've always said this, and I still stand by it. They need to go back to the old animation styles. You know, Justice League Dark's been doing it really good. Like, the old real, like, nice comic book style, almost, animation um you just don't see it a lot anymore not especially not theatrically i know like you could do this entire thing live action if you really wanted to i don't think it would hurt the film but i think it would it, this this does look quite good oh god the way it is sorry so, i just um i'm not complaining i was like super happy with the um the music on it like the soundtrack was pretty decent yeah. And then I read underneath it, um, in on the Wikipedia kid page here, um, Creed's song "Higher" was played in many of the theatrical trailers for Titan A, but the same the song did not appear either on the soundtrack or in the movie itself. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, Creed's not good. Yeah, the music in this is like. It's very like if you're a bit if you can. I'm not gonna say it. Yeah, no. If you're, it's not like super good, obviously. But like if you're, if you can like unironically sit through like a song, some song like the Hedgehog music, you'll be fine with this. And that's not nearly quite as bad. Um, certainly works better than it did with the uh, like Son a Sonic Adventure. Higher isn't the worst Creed song. But, uh, yeah, this, obviously, I, I actually got Cosmic Castaway on my, uh, phone for music, so, which is the, um, featured song for this. And I do love just, I kind of do want to get the soundtrack to this now, it's kind of nice. I guess get into the film, uh, this science fiction animated film, which won the podcast, so. So, we open the film to a... As all good films should start with a um, opening monologue from uh, Ron Perlman, um, which is just a sign of any good movie, really. When is when have bad things followed a uh, Ron Perlman prologue? I'm I'm not actually going to answer that because I don't really have the answer to it. Do you think he he's he's another one of those guys who just kind of has been old as long as I've known him in theaters, right? what was that other movie he was in go on with the plot yeah yeah so he um gives us a thing about like um how humanity's like hit their is going to hit their next big uh technological advancement in the 31st century uh of the of a thing called the titan which is a bit mysterious they don't really explain what it does at the beginning of the movie so it's kind of, uh, it'll be revealed a bit later. But he says, oh, this is going to be the next big thing for humanity. 
Like this is going to be the, as big as like us inventing fire or splitting the atom. And that is why the dredge want to invade. The dredge is like an alien species that's um made of energy and they've come mm-hmm. to destroy the earth before the um Titan can get used. I've had some question like they say in this movie like oh they're af- uh, the dredge are afraid of what humanity will become which is really vague way of putting mm-hmm. it and like people can contribute uh, like say like oh yeah that's um really oh, what's the word uh like a really childish way of putting it but i i like to think of it as like um in star trek 3 i think um they've just like inv- unveiled this thing called the genesis uh project which um terraforms planets and makes them livable and the klingon villains in that movie uh want to destroy the genesis thing because this would give the federation an advantage over the klingon empire the titan does more than that so i think the situation is actually very similar to what's said in that movie because um the titan what it does we find out it does toward the end of the movie and is that it lets you make a new planet and like populate it with animals which is military like strictly strictly speaking militarily that's incredibly useful for space travel because i mean think about what the issue with space travel space travel is it's that okay um there's only like so many habitable planets around and like that would definitely dictate uh, like where you could put ships and whatnot. Whereas if you had the Titan, you just like okay, there's some raw material sitting vaguely in the habitable zone of the star. Put a planet there, and then put in that planet in the next one, and the next one, and suddenly humanity spread through the whole thing, and humanity's the next big sh- big thing threatening the uh, Dredge's military empire. Um, Mm -hmm. And perhaps um, we see the dredge like survive in um, space very easily later in the movie. So perhaps that's why they don't um, openly just like beat up the rest of the aliens you see in this movie is because like, hey, they have to go to a fancy planet in order to live. We can just go wherever. And the Titan threatens that. So, yeah, Yeah. that's why they blow up the Earth. So aliens invade. um, We get our image of our main character kale as a young boy uh playing with this doohickey which spins around in the water which he breaks but his dad uh his dad played by ron Burlman, goes to pick him up and says oh yeah we need to go because um aliens are happening uh so they takes them to the end uh he takes them back to the ship where he had where he sends him off with this alien tech while uh he goes to go say uh launch the titan to get it out of off uh world because mm-hmm. evidently this military either isn't strong enough or isn't fast enough to be able to prevent the destruction of earth and the dredge fire off this big space laser as a bunch of these um evacuation ships uh take off and end up blowing up the Earth. Um, we don't actually see any Earth military ships in this. We just see evacuation ships, which is a bit weird. But um, come to think of it, we don't see like a ton of like um, military ships in this other than what the Dredge has. So it's yeah. actually possible that the Dredge just blow up any space military. That actually could be very possible. Yeah, because we don't really see any like yeah. I mean, if 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 they were funneling instead of funneling all their money into warships, funneling all their money into a resource building like self, uh, I guess yeah, terraforming. It's like it's like instead of like the U.S. putting money into like uh, warships and uh, military, they're just like yeah, we're gonna give all our money to NASA. Yeah, or like um, more accurately, almost. If, like, instead of, like, influencing, uh, like, fucking with uh, other countries to get oil, it'd be, um, like, <laughs> building, like, a continent in the middle of the Pacific that just has a bunch of oil on it. So I mean, we could also probably do that. 
Except for I don't fuck with the ocean, so... <laughs> Cody doesn't fuck with the ocean. It's too powerful. <laughs> I don't this know what's down there. <laughs> <laughs> this is an ominous statement, which is that. I don't fuck with There's the so ocean. Much... Not since the last time. <laughs> you can only get that from learning about my backstory. <laughs> ah. Uh, doesn't fuck with the ocean. Anyway. <laughs> so, um, the Earth gets blown up, and uh, several co- uh, escape ships are blown up in the explosion, and then, like, the moon gets hit with, like, a bit of the Earth, so it's, like, very devastating. Like, billions of people have obviously died. So they've evacuated, and... We cut to 15 years later to uh, Kale in his early 20s um, working at a salvage operation um, to, like, salvage busted ships that have busted up as they're doing this. Uh, To the song Cosmic Castaway, obviously. He he finishes some cell... He's doing some salvaging when one of the aliens actually accidentally knocks him over the head with some salvage. Or rather, his spacesuit over the head, but I mean, that's about the same thing. Knocks him over, and he gets back at him by, like, firing his um, giant laser chainsaw vaguely in the aliens di- in this alien's direction in order to um, get back at him a little bit. So that happens, and then they um, have to... Job's done for the day, so he f- takes his little uh, rocket bike over to the salvage station, Tau-14. And we see our first uh, image of what, like, life for humanity is like after the explosion of Earth. Uh, There's a separate line for humans. Um, Yeah, so, like, there's some human segregation going on in here. Of, like, uh, because there's, like, five other humans that are, like, in a separate lineup waiting to get processed into the ship. Yeah, this is almost interesting, because, like, we don't usually see, like, um, this is very much humans as a refugee race. Because, like, they have nowhere to go, and they've, um, they're not, be- like, people are taking them in, but they're not treating them generously at all. Well, it's, like, kind of the exact opposite of District 9 at this point. Yeah, I haven't seen District 9. Um, what? Seriously? Yeah, no. I never watched it. Yeah, yeah I never watched it. Ooh. You have to go watch that at some point in time. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, it's... Better than Blight. I imagine most things are better than Blight. <laughs> I mean, it's a fourth level spell. I mean, it's pretty good, but... Or are we talking about Bright? Oh, is, that joke is it Bright? <laughs> I think, yeah. Oh. I thought it was Blight. I could be wrong, though, but... I don't think so. Yeah. Anyway. So, yeah, so... It's kind of interesting, because we get this little different look at how... Um, like humanity we're like we're not um big damn center of the universe we're kind of like just another species and not like a particularly well off one at that but kale isn't really taking any of this he um flies into the other lane of aliens to get into the ship early but he gets kicked out because uh Mm -hmm. he's not an alien he doesn't it's almost weird he's almost got a little bit of an attitude that's like he almost doesn't see himself as human, which is kind of an interesting thing, because he was, like, maybe five when the Earth blew up. That's an interesting little, like, um, immigrant thing, where, like, he was so young when he moved, he doesn't really feel any attachment to that old place where he's from. And he wouldn't see how... Uh, like, that should affect how he is, or, like, how he lives. Which, um, I think is an interesting, it's an interesting bit of characterization, I'll give the movie that. It's also pretty good in characterization, we get a, yeah, a little bit different. We're dealing with a very different humanity in this one, which is nice. So, frustrated by not getting into the thing early, he decides to take an expressway, presumably, um, straight in through, like, the big ship hangar, which um, he's warded away from, but he says, eh, whatever, they're not even going to uh, dock like one of the big ships here anyway. To which he promptly runs into one of the big ships. He knocks, he falls off his bike, 
and uh, lands himself on a the cockpit and finds a pretty girl inside who he waves at. Which is weird, but I'm willing to cut him like a little bit of slack here because this may be the only woman he's uh, human woman he's seen in 20 years. We don't see any other human females on the uh, Tau for uh, Tau 14. We only like see him and like four other men. Yeah, it's <laughs> this could literally be the only woman he's ever met. <laughs> like we don't obviously don't know his whole backstory, but well, since the age of five. Since the age of five, yeah. And his mother's not around at all, so... Well, his father's not around either. Yeah, yeah, though I don't think his mother was around when he left Earth, so... Because <laughs> we never see her. All I'm saying is he is very pointed about not having a father for half the movie. Yeah, no, he is, um... He very much, like is not, like, um, forgiving of his father uh, sending him off. Sending him off? Which, I guess... We'll talk a little bit more about that toward the end of the movie when we figure out more about this. Um, although, to be fair... Uh, to be unfair, rather, this movie did have, like, several rewrites. Um, including one by Joss Whedon. But, um... Huh. Yeah, Joss Whedon did do a rewrite on this at one point or script doctoring at some um, point but um there's been like there's like 19 writers that uh touch this and that has left uh, some plot holes but all in all i think it comes out more or less all right it's at least um divulged itself of enough generic tropes that it um somehow sur it somewhat survives some of the plot holes yeah but, like, yeah, it could be better, but, like, you're not, it's different from, like, if this was, like, a super generic story, because, like, okay, at least some different things happening, even if they don't do them as well. So there's that. But anyway, this happens, uh, he makes his way back into the ship, uh, he's getting some food at a cafeteria, which, um, is some sort of alien noodle which is green with, like, bugs on it. Um, he asks the chef for ketchup, and the chef's just like, we don't have any of your human ketchup here. You can suck it up. So he's talking to uh, Tech, the alien he had went off-world with, and he's just like, oh, I don't really like uh, this. And Tech gives him a little bit of shit about not um, reading up on his human heritage and uh, Earth history. And he's just like, yeah, who cares? The Earth is dead, and yeah, he's very much doesn't have a lot of attachment to um his home world, which is a bold move. Uh, we talked a little bit about this already, but it's led us to a character who's very jaded and doesn't really care much for being the hero until the very end, until he like reconnects with humanity. Because, like, as it is now, it seems like he's maybe, like, only connecting with, like, old guys who are just, like, have no attachment to him. And he kind of does get up to a point, like, reconnecting with his humanity toward the end of the movie, which is interesting. Uh, and I think kind of works on the level. There's, there's reasons to say it doesn't, but I think it ends up more good than bad. So at this point, we get our first glimpse of a character, or our second glimpse of a character we had seen briefly earlier on uh, their escape from Earth of this uh, character named John Corso, who was a so who was driving a vehicle. He had gone to pick up uh, Kale's dad and had dropped him off at the Tyson Project. Corso shows up on Tau fourteen. Um, he is uh, in command of that ship that Kale had crashed into a little earlier. So he meets with, uh, uh, as he's getting accosted by the two aliens he had pissed off, or the alien he had pissed off earlier, um, when he shot up, uh, shot at him, basically. So, to be fair, assault, <laughs> kind of, um, with a deadly weapon, <laughs> probably. So yeah, they do that. And uh, Corso saves him from these aliens and tries to recruit him to go uh, meet, uh, join up with his, uh, join up with his crew to save humanity, as he puts mm -hmm. it. 
but Kale refuses and goes to run o- and goes to run off uh, to after Corso releases the aliens who were trying to beat him up out of spite and like a sort of a nice little co- interesting conversation. So he goes back to talk to Tech and then Corso shows up to like reintroduce himself to Tech. Um, you could say it's a plot hole that Kale doesn't recognize Corso. But let's be honest, you don't you don't always like who recognizes their dad's work friends from when he was five. Yeah, 13 years in the future. Yeah, easily. Um, I think they say 15 years. Yeah, they do say 15 years. Oh, OK. Yeah, I was just going off of uh, the fact that he was five. Yeah, so he's um 20 at this point. The fact is, is I, at, at this point in time, as like. Because I've never watched this movie. I didn't watch it back when it came out in 2000. This is my first time ever actually sitting down and watching this. Or at least that I can't remember if I did or not. I would have been six at the time when this came out. Um, What I was going to say is I was wondering if there was going to be any um, explanation to why these people are just like, oh, trying to find this boy now that he's 20 years old. He's had this ring on for apparently his whole life. It's never done anything up until the people come in and are like, oh, let's take a pen and push the buttons on this uh, ring that they had. And it, Yeah, it's uh, told Kale that... had, um, sorry, I just got to bring this up. Go ahead. Because we didn't, I didn't really explain it. But um, Kale had um, been given a ring by his father on his escape from Earth. When he meets up with Corso for the second time here, he, uh, Corso takes uh, activates the ring and has Kale put it back on. And because it recognizes Kale's genetic pattern, it is showing a map on the palm of his hand, which will guide him to the Titan, which has been lost for 15 years. What I was going to say is, uh, I don't know how many people escaped Earth, but the, have they been just tracking down every 20-year-old? Or Well, no, um... Uh, Corso was at the beginning of the movie, remember? So Corso yes. knows about this guy, uh, knows about Kale. We'll talk about how he's, um, yeah, it's a little weird that K- uh, Corso didn't, yeah, that's the one big, uh, I suppose that's the big plot hole is that, um, I guess in this, the, uh, in this scenario that Corso didn't come for him earlier. Um, Tech brings up that, uh, he had, uh, that he had expected Corso to take him off his hands sooner. Yeah. So, don't really know what's that about. Um, my theory is that um, Corso was captured by the Dredge at some point. Um, between in the fifteen years at some point, probably released somewhat recently. I think I'll get into why I think that a little later, though. Yeah. So Kale is kind of still um, not really on board with going off to save the Titan and go with his father's legacy because again, he doesn't really respect his dad because he fucking sent him off with some other guy and never showed up again. Yeah. As they're um, saying, he doesn't want to go the dredge show up to uh, go pick up uh, kale and uh, pick kale and or Corso. And they start shooting at shooting at uh, the two of them as the, and they have to make their escape in a bit of a gunfight. Um, I kind of like the guns in this movie. I like the way they work. They're just kind of like spitting plasma. They feel like actual guns to an extent. And it's how I like my sci-fi guns. No, like obviously no offense to Star Wars. I just kind of like the um, just like plasma goo shot. Yeah. It feels very gun-like. It's a little different than like... Uh... Well, it gives you all the satisfaction of a gun and yeah. a laser. I was going to say, it's a def- definitely a different feel than a laser gun, because you don't... Yeah, it's very retro feeling without, like, being, um... Like, there's obviously recoil on, like, the uh, Star Wars guns, but you don't always understand why that is. But, like, whereas these, these, these feel like um, real guns to an extent. And I also like the aesthetics of everything in this movie. It's kind of got, like, um... A lot of it's vaguely steampunkish, actually. Just the way yeah. things are built. Obviously, not so much that like they're flying around on uh, space boats, but everything in this movie is like 
old timey so looking sort of like if you were maybe making a spaceship in that age, but you're not like um married to the concept of like just the regular rocket ship design like the um when we get to the inside of the titan it's very like um an inside of a hindenburg balloon whatever those are called uh zeppelin it's very, it looks kind of like the inside of a zeppelin yeah that's where this is a lot like the titan looks a lot like a very circular zeppelin with rockets attached to it when you like get down to it the ship they they do also have like a classic rocket ship um later in the movie in the phoenix and then there's something like um the valkyrie which is the ship that um corso is in charge of which is very slick and uh interesting design and looks uh almost like a blackbird kind of like the sr-70 yeah. blackbird and then like you get the dread ships which looks very different on their own and you get uh it's just like crude satellites like um tau 14 here and also the drifter colony later in the movie so you get all these very different designs and it all looks good and weirdly cohesive even though they aren't um all that similar i very much uh, the visual design in this movie is amazing it looks gorgeous i love it anyway so corso and uh kale have to make their escape um they find their way up some vents uh blow up a artificial gravity generator generator in order to float around and get places they eventually make their way to a hangar bay where they fight off some more dredge and try to make their way out in this uh ship which uh, gets shot a bunch um doesn't initially start kale gets out to try to start it again he gets shot a couple times by the dredge and they fly out of there with great damage to the ship eventually causing the cockpit to crap which eventually leads to them having to like break open the cockpit and uh, like fly to the valkyrie with um a fire extinguisher as their propulsion um yes you're ignoring the laws of the vacuum of space but i uh i am they're obeying the rule of cool so does that not work approve well no you'd fucking I... evaporate the second you get into the vacuum of space oh yeah okay but if they, they theoretically if they were in a space like a, a space suit they oh, could yeah. definitely use yeah okay yeah. no that's how that's how um astronauts get around they use like little bursts of air so that's how they is yeah. it it's just yeah that's um how their jetpacks work when they're doing like moonwalks and whatnot why would they like, think spacewalks they use like something else it's it's some sort of compressed air that they let out yeah but i mean it, like o oxygen in space has got to be valuable right like what it, what um, I'm saying I imagine is why are they using there? <laughs> it's probably CO it's probably CO2 actually. Oh? Yeah, they're probably ejecting like junk gas. Okay. Is what it is. It's probably not their oxygen. But yeah, no, they would have evaporated in the <laughs> vacuum of space is the bigger problem. Yeah. But it is really cool what they do here, so. So yeah, they make their way into the Val uh, Valkyrie uh they end up unconscious because they've uh I mean, they flew through the vacuum of space. You gotta give them some sort of punishment for that. He's getting uh, treated by the lady he saw earlier, Akima, who's using sci-fi stuff to heal his gunshot wounds. He gets healed. He is naked during this. Which, to be fair, medical procedure. So they do that, and we, get, uh, we start meeting the crew. We meet a character named Preed, who is um, the second in command of the ship. He's um, very kind of like a gross character who's like very sly and like scummy. But anyway, he uh, Kale shows Akima the map beginning their um, making cute, beginning their um, subplot of making cutesy faces at each other, mm -hmm. which in any other movie, I might give more shit, uh, more shit to this. Um, fact that they're falling in love so easily but on the other hand it's space there's some amount of slip slim pickings going on here i'm making excuses but like 
there's maybe like a few million humans left how many of them are like people your own age or female i i mean i I mean i also kale he seems not very approachable like decently attractive for a man yeah but he's got daddy issues out the wazoo and uh Oh, so so when so when women have daddy <laughs> issues, that's an opportunity. But when men have them, it's bad. I see how it is. <laughs> well, <Wow. laughs> anyway, <laughs> that was a weird tangent. Anyway, so so yeah, he um, Kale still say, has some doubts about this. He's not sure about like what the uh, Titan is doing. And he's like, hey, why are we doing this? Uh, like. Is there something to sell or salvage on that? What is this? We're just doing this for the hope of humanity. What are we doing this for? Some drifter colony bums to which Akima gets really offended and throws her clothes at him. Um, and it's revealed that she is from this place called Drifter Colony, um, which is um, they're very like optim like attached to the old world there. Um, whereas like, I guess a lot of humans, other places aren't. So yeah, they take some advance. I, the implication is that um, the drifter colony people are like stuff in the uh, stuck in the past, and are like um, not getting uh, not getting hip with the real world, and uh, need to get a damn job. The damn hippies is the impression I'm getting. Uh, we see drifter colony later in the movie. It's a bunch of like um, escaped uh, Earth ships, like welded together into a big space station essentially everything in this movie seems almost salvage yeah a lot of salvage in this it seemed to be like the um i was gonna say mad maxi but like mad max takes it to a very yeah, different this level is, um like we're it's practical i think is what it is like it's very like okay this is a thing you would do um, the ships very much look like they're built to do what they're built to do. Yeah. So, uh, we continue meeting the crew. Um, Preed takes Kale through the ship. Uh, they meet Stiff, their weapons expert, who's a big, um, kangaroo lady alien, who's, like, very big. She's maybe, like, her silhouette maybe is maybe, like, enveloping three people with, like, how her legs work. And then, uh, after they pass her, after making her drop some stuff... They meet this other alien played by John Leguizamo, uh, named Goon, who's um like the super intelligent alien who's like always inventing random kooky stuff and is really uh weird. And Goon helps him read the map, uh, and says that they need to go to Cesarine. Which is a home world of this uh, alien race, the mysterious alien race called the Gao. So they start heading there. Uh, yeah. Corso and uh, Kale have some conversation. Corso's trying to like sell Kale on their operation because he's not super cool on it. Because I mean, he's basically along the ride for now, just because like he doesn't really have another choice. But he says, "Hey." If you don't, if I don't like the way things are go, are going, I'll show you how much my like my father I really am. I'll leave, which is a cold son of a bitch line. See, this is this is the point that I was having earlier. At one point in this movie, I was like, "Oh, he was abandoned by his father at the age of five. I wonder if he resents him for that." And then he says this, and I'm like, "Yep." Yep, he definitely resents him for that. <laughs> no, that is like a... Hey. This movie has a maturity to it. Like, there's not, like, any big swears, but there's blood, um... Like, reasonable amounts of blood, actually. Like, obviously, Kale's just talk taking two gunshots, and he looked pretty bad after those. Another character takes one in later in the movie, and it's very bloody. No one really dies um i think a character gets his neck snapped later which is pretty bu- brutal um we see them drinking and they just make like very mature statements so this isn't really a kid's movie like it feels mature enough that an adult could watch it and i still do enjoy it to this day obviously mm-hmm. so so um they make their way to Cesarine, 
which is this planet covered in these um, plants, which are full of carbon, di uh, like hydrogen, which if you snip them the wrong way, they'll explode. Presumably as a way of spreading their seeds. I like this. Yeah, the set pieces, in, yeah, the set pieces in this are very unique. They'll obviously have a fight here, and they'll like cut up the um, uh, hydrogen trees they call them, and like use them as explosions and weapons to complicate the fight. And it's you get that you get a nice little thing, a way of going about this. It's fun to watch. So they meet the Gao, which are like bat people, um, and they direct Kale how to uh, activate the next stage of his map, which. Um, he does by pointing his hand at a at a moon and he makes the comment of like geez my father must have been right here which um indicates that like his father had like done this route before he had um before the earth had been destroyed he might have mm -hmm. like not always been all that present before the tide before the earth blew up either so that'd be another thing Bad yeah people, they're kind of I've I've seen some criticism brought up that it's weird that they um they're willing to like sacrifice themselves because uh, after this the dredge attack and the alien and the Gao are willing to like wait lay down their lives to protect um the crew of the Valkyrie and several of them die through this as they're flying away yeah yeah so that's a question it's not really explained because they don't talk really. They're semi nonverbal. Mm -hmm. They uh, just like talk through like screeches. They're actually probably more pterodactyl people. Yeah, and they have. Sorry, I was just thinking about this. They have really no stake in whether or not humanity is restored. Yeah, I mean, it's more. It's more about like um, restoring like former glory. It's implied that like without a home world, they'll just kind of die out. Which, I guess, maybe. I don't know. The, we don't get a lot of um, information on that. We don't see that the Dredge are, like, hunting down humanity wherever it goes. It's certainly not yeah. a good space they're in. But, like, perhaps something they could have overcome with time? I mean, this is definitely, like, a very dark phase in human history, if nothing else. Like, they're maybe down to, like, their lowest population. Obviously, I don't think reproduction was happening in everywhere, because like all kale call kale's colony appeared to be all male for humans anyway. We don't see any indication that mm -hmm. uh, aliens can interbreed, which is very realistic. Yeah, we can see the stakes, but it's very much like okay, maybe we could have survived this. But it's I can see your point there, though. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, they so they um try to escape. Uh, eventually that leads with uh, ends with um kale trying to fire a rocket launcher falling off the boat and uh, taking a kima with him so they both get captured by a dread ship and taken back to the dread uh, home base they jettison a kima out into space presumably so that um the tracking ship she wears uh what she's wearing doesn't like direct them to uh, direct the valkyrie crew directly to the dread ship and then they uh, capture Kale and force his hand open so that they can read the map, uh, which is leading them to the um, Ice Rings of Tigrin, which is a uh, what it sounds like. It's like an asteroid mm -hmm. belt made of ice, essentially. So they do that. Uh, Akima is recovered from a uh, space colony and um, is rescued from a slave pen. Where we get like one of the funnier scenes in the movie mm -hmm. where um, Preed takes Corso and Stiff in like slave rags and tries to um, sneak his way into the slave pens where the guard is just where the guard um, pegs them as trying to deceive them and uh, they have to like beat them up anyway. And we get like a the clip of the movie where Preed's just like huh, an intelligent guard. Didn't see that one coming. So that's kind of fun. And we get a couple fun scenes like this because it, um, it's like um, how we've kind of like entered like an age with like the Disney princess archetype where we're um, able to like look at it with enough 
um, self-awareness that we can make jokes about it while still like participating in the um, the tropes. So yeah, it's it's all it's always a form of progress, and it's nice to see. So they rescue Akima. Kale manages to break out of the dread ship because they're just not looking at him very well, and he's like able to like escape the ship by like touching the force fields in like different places, and steals a dredge uh, like a dredge fighter to fly off, which is um a very dumb part of the movie fully understand how nobody has ever tried how to escape I mean this. you could say that they don't take prisoners off uh, the, uh, that often but then again if they don't take prisoners that often why are they taking kale prisoner yeah but he he like just pretty much just pried open the plasma essentially right yeah like that's the motion he did is he touches it in one place <laughs> touches it in another place and just like zoop. And he tries touching it. He tries touching it once, and then it knocks him back. But if he touches it again, he's able to like open it with his fingers, which is dumb. And I have reason to believe the dredge had captured Corso at some point, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's weird. It's not a well put together part of the movie. Knocks a point off, probably. They had found some. They had found some way to do this better. See, I, I, I thought you're gonna like. Because you were hard defending that for a second. But yes, it is a very dumb scene. Yeah, no, I don't have, like... Yeah, I don't see, like, why, like, other people couldn't have done this. Because Kale's not, like, super, super good at, like, combat through this movie. Like, he shoots at some people. It's a... Well, it's not also, like, super smart or I anything I mean, he's good either. with machines, but... Yeah. Kind of. Yeah, he's... He's very, yeah. he's like, re, very adept with them, but, yeah, he just, he's not, like, very, like, super combat adept. He, like, wins, like, one fight in the entire movie, and only barely. And, I mean, in the beginning, he's getting his ass kicked, but that's a TV one. And he needs other people's help to win the fights he wins later in the movie, too. Um, His big thing is that he just, like, figures out the big uh, Deus Ex Machina at the end. If you can call it that. But yeah, no, I don't really have a defense for this scene. I don't think it... There's almost some, something you need to do to make this better. Um, They need to, like, rescue him or something. I don't know. But anyway, he gets away and manages to make contact with the Valkyrie and gets back in crew. Um, He dances around with Akima a bit because he got away. He meets with Goon. They find out they're going to the Ice Rings of Tigrin. Corso lets Kale fly through this um, gas cloud with these um, angel space stingray things. It's a very beautiful scene, actually. It's very nice to look at. I'm not doing it justice by giving it and saying silly names and making it sound weird. But yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, played to some cool music. It's fun. This is like a correlation to like earlier scenes where like he had asked Corso to drive and uh, Corso wouldn't let him drive. Once in the beginning of the movie, when he was four, when he was five, and then uh, earlier when they were escaping from Tau 4. So Corso lets him drive, and they have a bonding movie movement. And we see, like, uh, him trying, he, him sort of developing, like, a fatherly respect toward Corso. He says, hey, thanks for all this. This is more than my father ever did. Um, which maybe lends the credence to the idea that his father wasn't all that around all that much when he was a kid either. It's possible that his mom raised him. <laughs> and, like his mom didn't like die and just like died in the explosion of Earth. That's entirely possible too. We haven't discussed that yet. Like, see, this is what I like to call the Goku complex because I've seen it done in like Team Four Stars, oh. um, Dragon Ball Z Bridge. Where they've taken Gohan and they've kind of just, like, he has no character traits outside the fact that he hates his father and kind of hates humanity. That's this character's whole character up to this point. And <laughs> I'm not going to defend Goku at all in this scenario, but 
Chael's father in this movie literally sacrificed his life so that humanity can continue to exist. And this ungrateful <laughs> little ass is like, well, my dad wasn't around. Like, like what do you, what do you it's want? It's possible that he doesn't, he didn't fully understand that. Um, cause he was five. <laughs> and you're still defending yeah. him. Um, like I'm playing Devin Advocate, but yeah, he does, um, and he does like get over this a little bit. He certainly like reconnects with humanity as like he gets, um, closer along this, uh, flight. But yeah, I, I think you have a point there. That's fair point like i think it's a move that yeah that uh, the creators made that i think separates them from like a totally generic character but yeah i see where you're coming from i mean i wouldn't call it an oedipus complex because that's a very yeah. different thing but like it's a very different thing i don't i don't know what the, <laughs> i don't know what i'm going where i'm going with this um <laughs> Like, what? What's the term when we, you just want your like dad to be around? Like, ah, moving on. Um. So yeah, they arrive at um Drifter Colony to barter some stuff away to uh, uh get some stuff. Cole see uh, Kale sees Akima getting out of the shower. We don't see anything really, but it's mm -hmm. sexual tension. Yay. I don't really like the romance. I'm making excuses for it. And I'm very aware of that, just so we're clear. Uh, I would not tolerate this in any other movie. This is completely fair. So yeah, they're on their way out, and um, they catch Corso in a phone call with the door open, talking to the Dredge about uh, them like getting in his way of like recovering the Titan. So, yeah, he's been working with the Dredge the whole time. This is a weird thing, because this uh, introduces the problem of, like, okay, yeah, but Kale wasn't really hot on this whole save humanity thing um, until, like, later on. He could maybe have, like, just offered to uh, pay him, because, like, Corso talked up humanity through the beginning of the movie. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, my th my personal theory is that Corso was like captured at some point before the movie, and he's uh, because he knew uh, where the Titan was or knew how to get the Titan because he was obviously um, involved with the Titan project back on Earth, and eventually that led him to the like saying, "Hey, I'm not gonna tell you shit, but um, I'll do it for like some if you give me something." So. I'm guessing the dredge off I gave him a bunch of money to buy the ship, get a crew, and do this. I'm guessing that's how he ended up with Preed, but he also ended up with like Akima, who's very uh pro finding the Titan. So there's not like a ton of motivation not just to get straight murder mercenaries, but like Preed's obviously straight mercenary. Uh, he knows about the deal with the dredge. He um, sneaks up behind them and uh, gets them to, like, prov like goes to accost them as they try to walk away. Stiff and Goon could possibly be considered neutral toward finding the Titan. It's just Akima that's kind of weird. Maybe she just came with the shit. I don't know. There's, there's plot holes in this. I'm not gonna make it out like things but yeah that's my theory about like You're what happened. overthinking this and like yeah the dredge are gonna betray him by the end because of course they did um they've been betraying them the whole time because he's essentially trying to ransom the location of the i was just ship. i was just gonna say i don't know what exactly the the dredge have to barter with i mean um if we're going uh, probably they said money they said they were gonna pay him if we buy into my th if we buy into my theory it's possible that uh he uh like just has that he j he they paid for this whole thing including the ship so i don't know but yeah they're trying to get him to go along with this anyway because corso knows where to find the ring obviously so yeah they um have a uh interaction and 
they end up fighting a little bit. Uh, of course, uh, Kale and Akima end up uh, rushing off the Valkyrie onto Drifter Colony. Akima gets shot through the shoulder by Preed, and uh, they get left behind by the Valkyrie while the Valkyrie goes to track down the Titan. Um, yeah. So, that happens. Kale lets Akima get healed up while he makes arrangements to get a new ship which they recruit a ship called the Phoenix, which is a, like, old-timey rocket ship with, like, a lot of uh, spiffy accessories to it. Some guy was living in it, but they just re uh, repair it so that it's able to uh, uh, fly, and it flies really fast. So they get uh, hooked up to that. They get that repaired. They go to catch up with the Valkyrie, and they find themselves in the Ice Rings of Tigrin, which is... This is gorgeous little CGI landscape of like reflective ice and it's like a really cool like submarine fight moment where they're like trying to sneak around each other because I don't think the phoenix has any weapons and they're sneaking around through the ice and like using the reflections to trick each other and eventually uh, the phoenix gets away and makes its way onto the titan which they locate through uh, Kale's ring they make their way on board and we get a little bit of a more of a glimpse of what the Titan is. Um, they find like um, DNA samples of or DNA samples of various of every animal on Earth so that they could theoretically seed a new planet. And that's what the Titan is. It's essentially it takes um, raw material and uses like fusion and whatnot in order to make a new planet wherever you want. So, yeah, that's what the dredge are after. I've talked about this. So they try starting it up, but uh, by having Kale put his ring on the Titan's control panel, turns out the Titan blew its power supply escaping from Earth. So they can't just start it up. Otherwise, him putting the ring on the thing would have started the um, planet-making uh, uh, ability. It's revealed that uh, Kale's dad is probably dead somewhere presumably he left the titan at some point we don't find his body anywhere but but i guess he died some point um mm -hmm. by the dredge presumably um that's maybe how corso would have been captured or something so yeah they try setting up yeah. the thing and they gawk at that for a little bit but the valkyries right behind them preed gives stiff and goon an explosive device so they can kill them because they've been asking questions about the fact that um, they just ditched two of their crew members at the last space station for no apparent reason. I mean, as much as they might be neutral toward the Titan, they had some questions about their crewmates disappearing suddenly. So Preed is, tries to kill them, but Goon manages to get the watch away from Stiff and gets caught in the explosion, but I guess... Um, goons got very tough skin or was able to get himself far enough away from the explosion that he was able just to like recover from the blast so that happens and preed and corso have made their way onto the titan they threaten akima and start to get ready to kill them but preed turns on corso which starts in a fight between corso versus Preed versus Kale and Akima. Corso ends up killing Preed in the fight. Um and P Kale and Corso end up fighting. Eventually Cor uh, Kale takes Corso off the edge of a bar or off the edge of um the platform they're on and he falls off the platform after Kale tries to save him briefly. Uh, but he survives grabbing onto a support cable of some sort. So yeah. Meanwhile, the dredge have shown up. So they need to find out a way to get out of here. But he's just like... Kale brings up that like, Hey, the dredge are pure energy. If we um, recalibrate the systems, we can use the dredge to uh, power up... We can absorb the dredge because they're pure energy... And use that to power the Titan. So they start getting that set up. 
but there's one like circuit connector out on the outside that's uh not working properly so they need to so he uh, kale needs to go fix that uh so he gets in the spaceship and goes to do so um meanwhile stiff and akima have to fire at um the dredge with turrets they do that um eventually all the turrets get taken out kale makes uh, gets trapped by a fighter ship when corso shows up and tries and uh saves kale because um the dredge know where the ship is they're not going to pay him obviously and frankly fuck the dredge um, i think the dredge fully understand how capitalism yeah, works. yeah that's very bad of them to go back on their deal about that how like inappropriate <laughs> of a big businessman to go back on the deal which they oh who are we kidding big businessmen always yeah. like to go back uh, on deals. sentient plasma yeah. creatures yeah another bad they dredge bad i'm starting to think like <laughs> Unless you're talking about Judge Dredd. Yeah. Then... Is Judge Dredd good? <laughs> I, I've never actually watched it. I don't know. <laughs> um, Judge Dredd is very lawful, neutral, in a lawful, evil society. That's what I'll say about Judge Dredd. Is it worth watching, though? Uh, the new one, yeah. It's really good, actually. It's an interesting. It's an interesting series. Absolutely. Um, like comics. comics are supposed to be okay. Yeah, it's got some points to make and like interesting stuff. Anyway, so yeah, Corso and Kale uh, start to fuck with the circuit connector. Um, event uh, short of it, Corso has to uh, use himself to bridge the circuit, so he dies. Um, once the dredge fire on the ship and they start absorbing the energy. Uh, so the dredge get absorbed into the ship's power supplies and the uh, Titan starts its uh, engines to regrow a new planet. And that's uh, how they beat the villains. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of tense in practice, just not how I said it. It's it's reasonably exciting. It's just not... Isn't... Um, sorry, I was just going to say, wasn't the, the issue... Is, is that they got this technology and they didn't want them to use it and then they used it and then their whole problem was gone. Um, say that again. What's stopping the dredge from just re-blowing up the machine? Sorry, what I said was that they were looking for this technology but it was hidden and they didn't want the humans to use this technology. And then they use the technology. What's them like stopping them from just doing it all over? I'm not entirely sure there's more dredge than this. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, that's maybe a dumb um, answer. Like, I fully acknowledge that's probably a plot hole, but I don't know that there's more dredge than this. But, like, presumably, um, they can just, like, keep moving the Titan around. Because um, they can't blow up the Titan anymore, but even then... Now, yeah, this is probably a plot hole, to be fair. Yeah. There's a lot of plot holes in this movie. That's why it's not a 10 out of 10 movie. I don't know. It's far from that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they do that. We then get to the end of the movie, and we see that it's a year later based on the um, time card we see at the bottom. And... It's actually a very gorgeous scene to see this planet remade. It, like, blows parts off the Titan and, like, draws stuff together and creates a gravitational pull. It's very, it's like, this movie's beautiful. I love it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, they end up on this new Earth, which uh, Kale calls Bob, and then he makes kissy faces with Akima. And that's how the movie ends. What do you give the movie, Cody? Do you have any points, actually? Any points about the movie? I was going to say that, um, Besides, like, the weird few odd plot holes that I've picked up, um, I'm not going to say anything bad about the movie. I think that I'm going to do actually something different for this score. I'm going to go with my first actual split score. For the movie, like, the visuals and the music, I'm going to give that a 10 out of 10. But, like, for the, the 
plot and all of the wrongs in the plot, so I'm going to give that about mm, 6 out of 10, maybe. Yeah, I feel that. I feel I feel what you're saying. Because, like, the script is not up to snuff. Just frankly, it needs, like, a couple fixes. It wasn't, clearly it wasn't quite in, like, a perfect place by the end of it. But yeah, the visuals are just, like, gorgeous in this. It's such a good-looking movie. I don't know if it quite translates to Blu-ray for sure. But, God, it is great-looking on DVD. Compare this to so many other movies, and they just don't look nearly as good. I'm giving it, like, a 7. And in all fairness, like, if I were to, like, give an award to Kale in this movie, um... This guy is probably like the like worst antagonist next to uh, the kid from the Black Cauldron. I don't know which one I like more because they were both done so awful. <laughs> um, did this win any awards? Curious about that. Uh, sound effects like awards. As reading some Annie Awards, um, Golden Reel, no Golden Globes or anything. What won the Oscars that year? Um, mm -hmm. Golden Reel for Best Sound Editing for an Animated Feature. Nominated for quite a few. It lost to um, X-Men, which is pretty ironic because that's also... Which was another 20th Century Fox movie. Mm, yeah, that's fair. I'd say X-Men is a bit better. Was their Best Animated Movie in 2000? Best Sound, Best Art Direction... You see, I could have given this best art direction, maybe. I could see that. Mm -hmm. Sleepy Hollow won that year. I think I think that's put probably puts that in Yeah, not even a nomination. I yeah, I think that could have squeezed out a nomination for Bet Product Best Art Direction. There's some novels. You have this? Oh. Yep. I look into that. There's three of them. Cool. I swore my uh once comic yeah, that book. That be fun. I might look into that. I don't think they have a best animated animated film. Doesn't seem like. Huh. Um, oh, it's the year after this. Academy Awards, best oh. Yeah, the year after this, they introduced best award win uh, a best um animated film. So yeah, that kind of got cheated. But I don't. And what won in two thousand one? Uh, I don't know. I didn't look it up. Um, I just I, I threw my phone to the side. Okay. After I saw that. But I don't think this would have won. I don't know what it was up against, but it, it definitely looks really, really good. So yeah, I think that's the end of that. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to read this. It received a nomination for Best Motion Picture and Animated or Mixed Media, but it lost to Chicken Run. Boo. Although Chicken Run's good. I like Chicken Run. <laughs> I can't say a bad thing about Chicken Run. I definitely watched this more. Yeah, but Chicken Run's like claymation, correct? Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, Stop yeah. Stop it motion. Is. It's Wallace and Gromit. And a sequel is in development, according oh, to uh, the Wikipedia page here. We don't need that. <laughs> um, I don't think this would have gotten a sequel. Yeah, this was. Sorry, there, there was just a thought process that I had here quickly that. It speaks to who they were catering the audience for back in the early 2000s compared to who they were catering. I guess you can't really say this. I wouldn't call this a kid's movie necessarily. They were catering it to uh, 13 to 14 year old boys is what they were aiming for. That's on the record. And that makes sense. This is very like... Is it? Yeah, that's on the record as them saying that. This kind of like feels like it's that anime okay. level of maturity. Back my... To be fair, you could play this yeah. on like a show that plays anime. Seems alright. Okay. Yeah. About right. Well, cut that out. <laughs> no, I mean that's an interesting conversation. Yeah, it's it's all right. I I kind of like it. I think it holds up all right as far as like the plot was never great, so the plot definitely needs work. But it's it's fun to watch. I watch it every couple of years, I think. It's good. I've watched it at least as, as much as some yeah. of the Star Wars movies I own. Well, I mean, if you have it on DVD. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's sitting there. It's one of my favorite DVDs. I love it. 
yeah, so that's it for this week, I think. Um, next week, I have Curtis back on to review RoboCop 2. Kind of, uh, to I'm putting it in, like, the slot we had, like, Predator 2 in. Of, like, a sequel to, like, a very popular movie. Mm -hmm. I don't think RoboCop 2 is going to be good. But we'll find out. Won't we, listeners? You're all watching this with me, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, Maybe? I don't think they are. We got, like, 24 minutes. Yeah, I don't know if, um... It's, I was going to say, I did start listening to Driving Miss Daisy on my work to, like, walk to uh, the store today, so. So that was the thing. Uh, after that, Cody will be back to um, do part three of our uh, worst movies to win's best picture, which I will announce next week. Remember to f uh, follow us on Facebook and Kyle and Cody's Called Cinemacast. Follow us on uh, Twitter at Casey Cinemapod. I guess uh, I got... Uh, my personal Twitter at Lord Brokenshire and Cody has a new product project up and running. I, yeah, I started streaming, uh, the other day, just out on a whim. I, you can find me on Twitch at the real Cody up and, um, and you can also find me on Twitter by Googling my Twitter handle, which is also the real Cody up and, I think when I made my Twitter, it was like three o'clock in the morning. So my my Twitter uh, handle might be the real Cody Upman, M A M, not M A N. So I mean, you can change uh, that. There's that. You can fix that. <laughs> I changed mine when I did Lord Brokenshire. The handle? Yeah, no, I, or... I changed. I mine was like at one point. I'll cut that out. But yeah, yeah. No, you can change that uh, to fix it. Okay, I'm reasonably sure. Play that. with your settings. And you can find my Twitch channel at the fake Cody Upman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do that. That's too much. Uh, I have better things to, to do. tell you why I'm going by this is because I used to play a game called Smite back when MOBAs were a thing. And I, I was talking to my friend, and I'm like, hey, get into this game. It's cool. It's called Smite. And he went in, and he created an account, and he named the account Cody Upman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so so now now I have to distinguish between all the other fake Cody Edmonds out there. So <laughs> Ah, that's good. I'll maybe, have to I'll maybe have to jump in on somebody's stream eventually. I don't know. Anyway. See you guys next week. Have a nice uh, day. We'll see you next week for Robocop 2 in the 11th episode and the 11th hour. <laughs>